Good morning, Amity. So happy to have you with us this morning. It's raining outside, and thank you, Lord, because we need that rain to green us up, that's for sure. So with happy hearts and reverent hearts, let's be in an attitude of worship. Everybody, please rise, and we're going to sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. everyone let us pray dear Lord thank you Lord God for the opportunity of worship for the freedom to be amongst your family meeting together in your house and in the warmth of your embrace thank you that in worship we put, can put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of the kingdom for your promises are not changeable but immovable and eternal Thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and fears that trouble us and leave them there, knowing that your strength and insurance are all that we require. We ask for your blessings as we draw near in worship and are transported from a world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence, finding healing, wholeness, and refreshment. Thank you, for, thank you Lord God, for the opportunity of worship. In Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. 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 Majesty. Worship is majesty. <laughs>
please join us for the call of worship. Thank you. What shall I offer the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. God has blessed us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God. You will not turn away. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> be thou my vision. <laughs> In a few Sundays, we're going to have a pitch in July 31st. Um, we decided the Pastor Parish Committee is going to host this. We will have uh, sloppy joes and ham sandwiches. Uh, we will provide the drinks, the buns, and a dessert. So uh, sign up for side dishes. Uh, relish tray, fruit, um, salads. And if you can't bring anything, we do not want anyone to stay home because they are unable to bring something. Don't worry about it. There's always food enough for everyone. We want you to stay. We want to make it a special time for Becky and Mark uh, because this will be their swan song with yeah. us. But I think we're going to be knocking on their door again because <laughs> we want to see them from time to time. We're not changing our phone number. There you go. And we have your number. <laughs> All right. Change this to our prayer, Chuck. I have a couple prayer requests here. Jan Power tomorrow is going in for cataract surgery. <coughs> so prayers for her, the surgeon and a very good outcome. And then from Carol, Joyce Sipes is having tests on Tuesday. So prayers for her. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Go okay. Sherry and I have 58 years tomorrow. Where have the uh, where have all the years gone? <laughs> Congratulations! Happy anniversary! Hang out there. Same same place all the rest of them went, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Wherever that is, uh, right. I just wanted to say a word. Uh, sure. uh, Jean, I know who you are, Jeanette. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I am a professional speaker, by the way. No, <laughs> no, seriously, I had a uh, message or uh, Donna Hendricks wanted me to share with you her progress. Um, most of you know that um, she had surgery uh, a week ago Friday. She said it was uh, nine hours. Uh, they uh, found uh, some cancer. Um, it was, it's, part of this is from then, and she's updated it since then. Uh, but uh, a doctor, the doctor said, I have the enzyme for this cancer, so which I think, Sherry, I think that's a good thing in this particular case. Uh, they call it a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, the good news is, she says, it's a slow-growing tumor. Uh, there will be treatment, one injection uh, uh, each month, uh, but the doctor is very hopeful and very positive, and she is feeling uh, much better already through some early injections and medications and treatments, uh, and so that, that's very positive for her, and she's feeling much better. Uh, she has now uh, left the hospital and is going to recover at Conway's sister's home in Marion, and uh, we, uh, Carol put the address in the bulletin for us this week, and so uh, on the back there, if you want to uh, send a card, uh, or call Donna, I know she would welcome that, um, and, uh, but that's the address there that you might want to hang on to. And then uh, from Friday, this, uh, just a couple of days ago, I'm doing so much better today. Everybody, sit, including my doctor, said I look so much better. So that's, uh, that we all like to hear that. Uh, they, she was released Friday, um, and, and again, uh, the symptoms uh, are, are better. She's feeling much better, so we continue to pray for Donna. Janine, you had something? I was just going to uh, announce that our regular meeting today is Saturday night. Okay. So we're going to continue. That's good news. Good news. Okay. Go to the next screen, Chuck, please. <coughs> and keep these people in your prayers. Bobby, Lois, Hank, Eric, Cindy, Kevin, Donna, the Thompson family. I changed. We've been praying for Bryce for the last two years. He passed away Friday morning with his family and his parents mm -hmm. by his side. So keep them in your prayers, um, they need it. Yeah. He was only 16 years old. Yeah. And um, infusion buddies of Carol, Sue and Jen. So um, any um, prayers that we need to be lifted up this morning? Jesus, keep me near the cross.
pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here today, and as um, Jeanette mentioned earlier, what a privilege. Uh, let us just never forget and, and uh, feel what a true privilege it is that we have to worship you freely. Uh, Lord, there's a lot in this world, in our country, in our society that distresses us, um, and we none of us know where the future is headed, of course, but, but you do, and uh, we're, we're safe with you. We're safe in the palm of your hand, and that's why we come to worship you, Father, to get things where they ought to be, get things in their proper place, to put you first and everything else after that. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of love and grace and strength and power and might and glory, and that uh, you welcome us, even us, uh, to come into your presence, to know you and to have fellowship with you, to walk with you and Father, you are so good and so kind and gracious. Uh, you've done so much for us. Father, we are here only by your grace. And um, you've met our needs. And in most cases, most times, Father, much, much more. And so we're thankful that uh, for that. We're thankful for your goodness and your love. And, and Father, I pray today for any of us here and some who are not able to be with us right now, but uh, who just need a just extra assurance, just an extra uh, touch of your love and peace uh, for whatever it is that might be going on. We, we, uh, we ask for the unspoken request, and um, they may be unknown to us and each other, but, Father, they're known to you. And so, Father, for anyone today who is hurting or struggling or worried or, or, or hurting, I just pray that you'll meet them right now and Touch them by your Holy Spirit and let them know that you do love us. No matter what we're going through, we know you're going through it with us. And uh, the psalmist, King, uh, David the shepherd boy, uh, said and encouraged us that we are, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're, we're walking through it and we're getting through it uh, because you're with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. So, Lord, just help us to know your presence today in a very real and true way and a fresh way in the way that we may need it especially right now. And we also uh, do intercede for those that we've mentioned for prayer and concern. And we do pray, Father, for this family who is experiencing a tragic loss of a young man. And we pray for them and others, Lord, who are going through loss and sadness and uh, bereavement and uh, having to go on without someone close and important there. And uh, we also, Father, pray for the sick and uh, those recovering from surgery and those enduring chronic pain and those going through treatments and those in the nursing home and uh, just so many things, Lord, that are going on uh, among us and that we know about. And But you're the, the God who is uh, over and above it all and you know it all and you care about it all and each and every one, uh, Lord, especially as if they were the only one. And I pray they'll know that and feel that right now. And Lord, we thank you that we know you and can walk with you. And we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you individually, but also as members of the body of Christ. And we pray that you might continue to mold us and shape us and lead us into being the truly the body of Christ here in this place at this time. And uh, Father, again, we thank you for each one in the various uh, 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 gifts and, and, and talents and, and the special things that each one brings to the, to the church. And we pray you'll help us to be a stronger together and to grow closer together and father again as we've said uh, we none of us knows the future exactly we know that we are uh, in the midst of change and uh, new things are on the horizon uh, but father we pray there there are good things that you're going to use to bless us and to bless our community through our church and we pray that uh, your hand will lead us and and guide us through it all and we can just put ourselves in your hands and trust you and uh, know that you will uh, uh, bring us to a, to a good place and a better place as we follow you moment by moment and day by day. And watch over us all, Father, as, again, as we uh, proceed, as we go uh, to make decisions and choices that uh, will affect our future. But again, Father, may your will be done in us and through us and in all things. We thank you, Lord, that, again, you're just so good and faithful, and we thank you that you're with us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue to give him the glory uh, through, uh, through loving, sacrificial, thankful giving of our tithes and offerings. And we'll have the ushers to come. Father, we uh, give uh, because you first given so generously to us. And so we uh, dedicate these, our tithes and offerings to you, to your church and the work of your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Morning. Scripture reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 14. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteous of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and anticipation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, however, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it, all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that of which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the readings of God's mighty and powerful words. Yes, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, it's good to be back uh, with you today. I uh, appreciate everyone. Uh, you know, it's a good feeling to know when uh, when I'm not here, there you, you you are well able and capable to just move, go right on, and uh, have good church. And I know you had a had a good preacher last week, uh, Pastor Wade, a dear friend of uh, uh, Becky's and mine. And um, I know you heard a, heard a good message. I have yet to hear it, and I uh, look forward to. Um, uh, doing so, uh, we have the recording of last week's service, and I apologize for not having it available to you sooner. Uh, Becky and I have been uh, uh, traveling all week. We went to see our 
daughter Sarah and her husband uh, Brian and our granddaughters there in the D.C. area, and that was that was good. And um, the worst part was having to come home, but that's okay. You know, you know how that is. You know, it was a good visit, and and uh, they were probably ready for us to come home. Uh, I, ex I expect uh, no. Nah. But anyway, uh, so I haven't just haven't had a chance to uh, get that posted yet, but I'll do that this afternoon. And so those who didn't get to hear or want to go back and hear again uh, the, the good uh, service from last week, it'll be on the church uh, website. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone uh, filling in and, and taking good care of the church uh, in, uh, in my absence. Well, how long, how long, ha you don't have to answer out loud, but how long has it been since you stopped at a filling station to ask for directions. That's been a while, hasn't it? Uh, as I say, this past week visiting uh, family there in the D.C. area, uh, what, uh, we had to fill up with gas, and I, uh, uh, in fact, I saw two or three different places pull into a, a, a shell station and filled up with gas, and it was a service station. I mean, they, you just don't see that much anymore. They, were, they, it was, they had uh, two uh, uh, garage doors, had some people, they were servicing, working on cars. It was an actual service station. Uh, uh, you know, usually most, most air, uh, all you find are convenience stores or mini, or mini marts and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I, even, even so, even though it was an actual service station, I didn't bother uh, asking for directions. Uh, uh, I, I just haven't done that for a long time. Of course, one part, one reason is I'm a man, you know, so you understand that. Uh, but we didn't have to stop and ask for directions. And we didn't have to fish around in the glove compartment where there are no gloves to find, to find the, uh, the big paper map and unfold it and try to get it folded back in. We didn't have to do that. We just typed the address into the GPS no, not to, we, we spoke the address into our phone. Think about that. You just go, you just tell, whoever, who would have thought that 40 years ago? Just talk, say the address into your phone on the, on the wall. It wouldn't do you much good back then, but you just speak the address. And, and, then, and then there's this sweet voice that comes on. That just tells you where to go and where to turn next and how far it's going to be and and uh, getting this lane, getting that lane. Next thing you know, we're there exactly where we want it to be all the time. Which is a little bit what uh, Paul is doing here in Philippians three. Uh, it's, uh, in some ways, uh, like <clears throat> a GPS for our walk with God, for our walk with Christ, and our, and uh, and to live out our relationship. With him, so let me make a couple of observations about that here uh, in in uh, in this passage. First of all, we find the point of walking with God. We find the point of it all, and that's in verse eight. Look at what Paul says: "I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider everything else rubbish, garbage." manure, whatever you want to call it, I consider everything worthless in order to gain Christ. Now, these are the words of a man who knows where he's going. Uh, these are the words of a man who knows what he's all about. And one way you can always tell what a person is all about is by observing the very last thing that they'll let go of. Uh, Paul says here, I compare everything a loss compared to knowing Christ. In other words, I'm willing to let everything else go except Christ. Uh, what about you? What, what's your last thing? What, what is it that you will hold on to longer than anything else? And what would be the last thing you let go of? It reminds me of those majestic, lay-it-all-on-the-line words that close uh, Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. 
I consider everything a loss, Paul said. And as the world normally assesses profit and loss, Paul's loss was considerable. Those weren't just idle words. Because before he met Christ, by any normal standard, uh, Paul had it going on in life. Look at Philippians 3, verse 4, a little before the passage we read earlier. Paul said, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, that's a really up there kind of uh, Jewish person. As to zeal, persecuting the church. As to the righteousness in the law, blameless. In terms of achievement and status and position, Paul had arrived. That is, until he met Christ. Though religious, outwardly righteous, zealous, moral, and sincere, that blinding light on the road to Damascus exposed Paul, the real Paul, exposed him for how very far from God he really was. You can be religious and be far from God. Jesus said at the last day, there will be people protesting in the presence of God on the day of judgment and saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and such and so in your name? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? And Jesus will say to some of those, depart from me, I never knew you. And so it was with Paul. He had it all going on externally, but he didn't know the Lord in his heart where it really counts. Whatever was to my profit then, Paul said, whatever I thought was so important before, the things that I thought made me a big deal, the prominence and position I was chasing after, I now consider all that loss for the sake of Christ. Paul could have written the old gospel song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And when you do, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's all about Christ. Or is it? Is it for you? What is it all about? To have your name on a church roll? have a record of your baptism somewhere way back? I mean, what's the point of all this? Of reading the Bible or listening through a sermon or, or, or singing a hymn? or What's the point of Bible study or saying a prayer and taking communion? Well, it's right here. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. As important as it is, as good as it is to sit in a service and come every Sunday and have good attendance, greater still is to want to know Christ. As important as it is to be a good person and live a clean moral life and have a good reputation in the community, greater still is to want to know Christ. Now these other things are not pointless, of course. It's just that they're not the point. I want to know Christ, Paul said. You know, being a Methodist is a great thing. But greater still is to want to know Christ. And by the way, whatever the future may hold, being a Methodist is still a good thing and still a worthy thing, at least Methodism in its truest John Wesley and Charles Wesley sense of the word, whatever we may have done to it, whatever the current leadership may have done to it, being a Methodist used to mean something, something good, and it still means something, at least it could. True Wesleyanism, the gospel, the Wesleyan gospel of actual real heart change, when the Lord Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, actually changes a person's heart. The message of holiness, living a life of holiness, of heart and life. The John Wesley Methodism that once literally changed the world and changed England and has changed the United States in its earlier days. That kind of Methodism still could change the world. 
And it does. And it has every time it's tried. Just ask the folks in Africa who are preaching the, and living the true Methodist gospel and they're believing the Bible. And they're believing and insisting on, on uh, Christian uh, morals and ethics. And the church there is, is growing exponentially while the Methodist Church in the United States is declining to the point where there are now many more Methodists in Africa and more and more than there are in the United States. So all to say if it turns out that through as things develop, if we're required to take the corporate logo away and to take the cross and flame off of the church or off of our other materials and wherever it is, well, all I will say is this, just be sure don't let the flame of the Holy Spirit that it, mean, that it symbolizes, don't let the flame of the Holy Spirit and don't let a burning love for God and neighbor ever grow cold and don't ever let it die out regardless of what's on your building or what's not. Being Methodist is a, is a great thing. Whatever they call us, whatever you call yourselves, just understand that. Well, sorry, got off the beam a little bit there, but again, Paul's point, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, and Paul be the first one to say it was worth it. It was worth every bit of it. But then in addition to the point of spiritual growth, we have here the passion for walking with God, the passion for walking with God. Now, most of us remember the story from somewhere along the line, the, those Acts Bible studiers from past year. We went through uh, the study in Acts chapter 9 uh, where Paul was converted. He uh, unmistakably and uh, dramatically met the Lord face-to-face uh, uh, -face on the road to Damascus in the blinding light. But understand this, that was just the beginning, not the end. That was only the beginning. Here Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to become like Christ. But he goes on to say, I'm not there yet. I got a ways to go. I'm not perfect yet. But I can tell you this, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. The, we need to hear the intensity, uh, it, 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 the, the emotion, the, the, the drive, and the determination he's He's trying to express, to, to press on, to, to go farther with Christ. Now, we may not be perfect in this life. If you are, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you got in this imperfect church, but, you know, no, we're not perfect. You aren't, I'm not. Uh, it, but it is possible, by the grace of God, to have a perfect desire. Again, this is Wesley. This is Wesley in uh, teaching and, and theology. It is possible to have a perfect desire, by the grace of God, to have a pure heart. No, we're not perfect in every particular. That's not possible in this life. But it is possible to have a pure heart toward God, to live with a burning passion for God. I'm pressing on. Uh, the old song, Carol, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Paul said, I'm pressing on. In the book, uh, Leadership Secrets of Billy Graham. Can't go wrong there, right? Leadership Secrets of Billy Graham. But the author talks about uh, Billy Graham's uh, uh, overall priorities and strategy. Now, we, uh, most of us remember the crusades and the preaching and the invitation, and the crowd streaming to the platform and to receive some literature and be prayed for by Billy Graham and with the assurance that your friends and the buses will wait and all that. But the author in the book points out what is less well known. He said, Billy observed that evangelism is only 5% of the task. And when this is done, the other 95% is just beginning. That is, to keep the convert resting in Christ and growing into maturity in Christ and in the church. Billy focused on the 5% and encourages churches to follow up with the elements of the 95% for spiritual growth. And that's why he never conducted a crusade without an expressed united invitation from the churches in the city or in the area because he knew there wasn't really much point in gaining a large number of converts if churches and pastors weren't then on board to help them grow and mature in their new faith and in their new relationship with Christ. Now in John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, 
uh, straight out. He said, well, you must be born again. Born, start. Yeah, there, you got to have a new start. So being born again is, is, is where it's at, but that's not all there is. I mean, I mean being born, well, you know, we, don't want, we don't want babies to stay babies all their life. We got a new one, what, 10 weeks old now? And, but he's already changing and, and interacting, and his features are changing. And if he still looked like he did the day he was born, something would be terribly, drastically wrong. So growing is normal. Growing is natural. Growing is expected. And it's the same with a spiritual birth when you're born again in Christ. And if we aren't learning and maturing and growing more and more into the likeness of Christ, then you can be sure something is drastically wrong. See, becoming a Christian, that's only the beginning. Paul says here in Philippians 3, I'm not yet perfect. And so I keep straining and striving and seeking and leaning forward so that I may know Christ more and more. And the word he uses here for press on uh, literally means to chase or run after or, or pursue. And so any of us, really, we ought to be able to look back and say, by the grace of God, I'm not what I used to be and I'm not where I used to be in my walk with Christ. But at the same time, we ought to be able to say, and we should say, by the grace of God, I'm not where I'm going to be five years from now or whatever time from now. God help us and give us, a, give us a good hard nudge or whatever else might be necessary. If we ever get the idea that, that I've arrived, this is it, I've reached the top. We had uh, one woman in uh, one of our churches and uh, uh, her uh, friendly um, I don't think she was serious. I'm pretty sure she wasn't serious, but she would see me and she'd say, oh, Mark, the perfect man. I, so something tells me she wasn't quite being honest you know, or, or, or serious. And um, I, I got to thinking about it and looking, talking about it, and she said, well, it's in the Bible. And sure enough, if you, uh, if you get your King James Bible, you've got to have the King James, by the way, Get the King James Bible, go to Psalm 37, verse 37. It says, Mark the perfect man. Hey, I didn't write the word. I just tell you what, I just tell you what's in there. I just tell you what the well, it, 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 that's only in the King James. The newer, uh, some of the uh, different translations exp, uh, explain really what it, it's getting at. It really means consider the godly, consider the righteous. Is, is the idea. So mark the perfect man. You've got to be careful. Uh, you know, uh, 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 there, it, it illustrates the uh, very basic uh, principle of Bible interpretation, and that is this. Uh, uh, any text without its context is only a pretext. And so I can run around saying mark the perfect man all I want, but, you know, a little context and a little Bible study might, might uh, clarify the issue quite a bit making the point simply that, of course, I've got a lot of growing to do. If you only knew, you've got a lot of growing to do. And there are yet many more steps upward on our spiritual journey. And in fact, if we're settling, if, if we're settling for the status quo, if we're just kind of coasting, and if, we're, if we've grown complacent and satisfied, then all that is, that's just indisputable evidence of just how far it is we've yet to go. Well, then uh, third, let's say a word about the path uh, for walking with God. And, you know, someone might say, well, I want to grow. I want to do uh, make progress with the Lord. I, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I don't feel like I'm not getting anywhere. I, I want to be a better Christian. What do I do? Well, when it comes to walking with Christ, some roads will take you there and some won't. John Wesley called these roads or pathways means of grace. Or, 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 or methods uh, to, the, to get to the end or to the goal of spiritual growth. Now, sometimes they are called spiritual disciplines, which are like rails on which the engine of our faith can travel and progress. Uh, some of you might recognize this picture from over in uh, Morristown. Uh, that... Uh, been sitting there a long time that I, as I can remember, every time I've gone to Copper Kettle, I think I've seen this. 
And I, I got a feeling it's going to be sitting there a lot longer because there's not much track there. Uh, if you're going to get it, if it's going to get anywhere, uh, it's not going to get very far off into the dirt and the grass. You know, there's going to have to be some more track. And so what we're, when we talk about means of grace and spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices, it, it, it's, like we're, it's like we're laying down rails on which uh, the, our, the engine of our spiritual life and our walk with Christ can run and grow. And, and these are the disciplines that we're talking about. Now, one of those uh, would be the, the spiritual discipline of worship, uh, and, and both public worship and also private worship. Now, uh, Pastor Rick Warren uses the word magnification when speaking about worship because however you do it, the purpose of worship, what it's really all about, is magnifying God and making him bigger, larger, and more important to exalt him in any possible way. So don't get hung up on the how. There's a lot, a lot of people worshiping in a lot of different ways. Don't get hung up on that. Focus on the who of worship. Who are we lifting up? Who are we exalting? Who are we magnifying? And uh, uh, whatever the style of music, whatever the leader, uh, whether we're at home, whether we're in church with a crowd, worship is anything we do to make God larger in our hearts and in our minds. Now, the reality is this. You become whatever you worship. Uh, Stanley Jones said many times, uh, it, it, whatever gets your attention ends up getting you. That's why we worship the first day of the first uh, part of the first day of every week to get our attention on the Lord where it needs to be. Whatever gets your attention gets you. And you just won't do very much growing in the Lord uh, without regular times for praise and worship with the body of Christ. You know, there are just certain things you can't get, you can't experience by yourself. Of course, sometimes that's the way it works out. But uh, uh, on the whole, there are some things you just, you just can't get. It's not the same. Somebody says, well, I feel uh, just as close to God out in nature or visiting the Green family at the golf course or, or uh, you know, sleeping in. I feel close to God when I'm sleeping. Oh, come on. You know, whatever that is, it's fine, but it's not the same. And we need each other, and we need these times. Another pathway to growing our faith is prayer. And prayer, boil it down, prayer is what? Prayer is simply communicating with God. And there is no substitute, try as you might, there is no substitute for spending personal time with God in prayer. Prayer is like plugging in spiritually to the power of God. Prayer is like turning on the faucet and just letting letting the, the, the Spirit of God wash down over our spirits. And prayer, by the way, is not only talking to God, but prayer is listening to God. Now, I firmly believe, I'm pretty sure, uh, God has never stopped speaking. God is a God who communicates to us and speaks to us. Uh, we aren't always so good at listening and stopping to listen and, uh, and, and waiting on the Lord until we hear Him and know His presence and know what He's saying. You know, that's what the old saints uh, used to call praying through. It might take a while. It might take hours. It might take all night. It might take days. But they, they would talk about praying through. You know, how long has it been since you talked with the Lord? You know, Richard, how long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? It might take a while. Pray through. It'll happen. Well, another pathway to growing in our faith, of course, is the Bible, the Scripture, the Word of God. How well do you know the Word of God? Well enough? Enough? Too much? You know, we, we can avoid a lot of our mess-ups and wrong turns and falls and regrets if we would, in the first place, pay attention to what, to what God has said. You know, one of the treasures uh, and legacies that Becky has from her mother is uh, her Bible. And uh, in Ivy's Bible, inside the front cover, uh, she wrote, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. And we say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, if I could just hear you. Lord, if you would just tell me what to do. Read the book. 95% of it's already there. We just have to read it and, and dig it out and uh, apply it. 
Someone said, the Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to a person who isn't. Take a chance on letting your, working your Bible, letting it fall apart. And, and we have so many things these days, study Bibles, internet, uh, 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 all kinds of software, study helps, all kinds of things to help us understand the Bible. And so there's really no excuse uh, for not knowing God's word better than we do. It just requires time and effort. But then another pathway to a growing faith is fellowship. It's important to be in a group of some kind or uh, maybe a prayer partner or, or a group of any size, just some kind of way to, to be with other uh, believers, uh, to, uh, 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 like a Sunday school class, a Bible study, a prayer group, whatever. To, to have, it's a place to belong, to know we're connected with other believers. It's a place to be supported and cared for when we're hurting. And you can learn a lot about the Bible studying on your own, but you can learn even more by learning together. But here's, <clears throat> here's the whole point. It's simply this. <clears throat> some roads will take you to Mohawk and some won't. I know uh, 40 years ago, that would have been, gosh, Becky, that would have been 40 years ago last month, I think, now that I think about it. <clears throat> they said, you're going to go to be the pastor at Mohawk. What's that? Where's that? <clears throat> they told us how to get there. Told us what road to take. And uh, lo and behold, we, they, that we got there. We got to Mohawk. But there were some other ways we could have gone, and we could have ended up at some other church. The point is, obviously, some paths will lead you to Christ, and some won't. And some of us may be on some of those paths, and we've got to deal with that. We've got to be real about that. But I do know for sure that these pathways that we've talked about and other things like, like the sacraments and, and co communion and witnessing and fasting, these things will lead us farther along the journey of becoming ever more like Christ. What kind of impact might we have in this community and in this entire region if we were to rise up and say, I want to strive and press on I want all of what God has for me. I'm not satisfied with where I am. I'm not, I, I, I'm not satisfied to rest on the glory days of the past. And I'm not content to stand still in the present. We take inspiration and direction and passion from the Apostle Paul here and say, I'm going to press on. I'm going to begin today. I'm going to press on and, and I'll be more for God and do more for God and, and get on some of those well-worn pathways which are sure to help make us more and more like Christ himself. It's worth giving up everything and anything to know Christ and to follow him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word and your call and your challenge. We're thankful, Lord, for the possibilities. Thank you that we don't have to stay as we are. There is more. You have better things and more for us to experience and to know and learn uh, and Father, not a one of us can say we're, we're all the way there. You have more for us today and tomorrow and then from there on. So, Lord, uh, help us just to, to say, uh, open our heart to you today and say, Lord, here I am. Uh, do your work in me. Change my heart and uh, draw me close. And, Father, uh, uh, move me and, and, and uh, compel me, compel us uh, to go forward into our lives and into our community to serve and to love and to be Christ in every possible way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Carol and Jan, would you come please? Please write. Lord, I want to be a Christian. I do, don't you? No. <laughs>
be like Christ and that we might uh, bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to folks in our community and our world who so greatly need it. Go with us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.